Good morning. Everybody have their coffee? Yeah, you're all awake? Good, good. Okay. Um, well, I get to uh, uh, tell you about the uh, model that we're building. Okay, everybody's been talking about how great the future is going to be and how it's going to change. What I get to show you is a little bit about how it's going to get there. Okay, the, the, the real kind of details in this. Um, so, you're all familiar with movies and you have sneak peeks and trailers? Well, this is sneak peek. This is your trailer. This is the, this is the coming attraction that we have uh, for, the, uh, for OPATH. Uh, we are going to be releasing the technical reference model, or are we calling it the TRM. Uh, it's a multi-part document. I'll show you the parts on it. The first part is the technical architecture. Now, I want to clarify, what we're building in OPATH is not a system. This is not a system architecture. It's a technical architecture that shows how components could interact with each other so that someone can build a system. Okay, this, the TRM is coming. Uh, our goal is to have it out uh, late April, early May of 2018. Uh, just like any standard uh, activity, uh, figuring out where a committee's gonna go can take forever, but we have been making a lot of progress and we are very near, we believe, the end point to get through our final formal review. So this is going to be your sneak preview of what, what we're actually going to see. Okay, OPATH, it's a specification. It defines interfaces. It does not define a system. So uh, think of this as we're defining the interfaces on Lego blocks, but we're not telling you that you can build a ship with it, or you can build you know, a, a pirate ship, or you can build a, a space station. We're telling you how the pieces are, are designed and how they'll fit together itself. It's how these interfaces and, and components um, expose their functionality. And sorry for the fact we can't read some of that there. But they're exposing functionality. And the architecture is set up in such a way that components can be replaced. If you have equivalent components with the same functionality and the same interfaces, then they should be replaceable. Now this applies, could apply across it companies, but this could also apply within companies so that as companies develop systems and put in new functionality and new capability, it will show up. And we'll talk about that. Uh, the developers expose their interfaces but maintain their own intellectual property. It's confidential to them. It's very key when we talk about this, that companies have a business case for actually developing something that they can sell so that they can make money off of it. Okay, so you know, you, you think about the, the interfaces that, that you have today. Uh, you know, an interface may be on a cell phone. How does that cell phone work? Well, Nokia was doing it different from, from Samsung, which is doing it different from all the other companies that are out there. Um, they maintain their intellectual property, but they interoperate. We're trying, we are building a an, an technical architecture that gives us that same capability. So they're black boxes. We don't know what goes on inside. That's it. your intellectual property. But we do define what these specific interfaces are. Now we're going to release this in multiple parts because obviously it's a very complex system. We're talking about something uh, of the complexity of a DCS or a SCADA system or a, you know, a complete control system that is built. Uh, the first part of this is this technical architecture. That shows how all the big pieces fit together into a system, where the different elements are, and I'll show you some of those, those here. Um, that's going to be followed up by, t by documents that specify the detailed interfaces that are defined. So, uh, for example, uh, part two is that what we call our portable format definitions. This is the uh, definition of the information that defines the configuration of the system such that all the components can understand the configuration, can understand what role they play in your control strategies. They can understand exactly you know, what PID loops, what alarms they have, what the history is, et cetera. Uh, those will be part two. That'll specify those interfaces. Uh, part three will uh, specify what we call companion specifications. Companion specifications are things that are uh, beyond the base level information that would be available to one of these devices that we're talking about, you'll see DCNs. Um, we have an application framework interface that's coming out as well. That application framework interface is designed to give us portability of applications. So any of you out there who are software vendors, you would definitely like your software to run on multiple systems. You want them to be able to run with other other companies or you know, major vendors or, or other people providing it, um, 
the application framework is the environment for applications that would run, that would be portable and transportable. Remember, we had a whole set of criteria that we were looking at to try and build this system for, and this is it. Uh, the connectivity framework, how do all these pieces talk together? What's the uh, standards that we're using there? The physical infrastructure interface. We are talking about interoperability. We are talking about interchangeability. So one of the aspects of that is to say, okay, we're, we're a control system. Guess what? Control systems have to hook up to I.O. I.O. comes in on wires sometime, somehow, goes through terminal strips. Right now, there's no standard out there in the industry. Everybody's got their own different one. There's no interchangeability. There's no interoperability. So part of the physical infrastructure interface is talking about how do we come up with interchangeable, interoperable pieces so I can take out a module from one vendor, and if an equivalent module from another vendor has the same form, factor, and functions and interface, I can plug that one in. Okay. How many of you out there would like to have I.O. from multiple sources out there, end users? <laughs> Lots of end users, I think, would like that, yes. Uh, and it also talk about the physical connection to the network. Uh, we're we're going to, obviously, security is important, so we have a whole section on security. The security aspects uh, technical reference manual is going to talk about general pieces, but the individual elements are going to show up in each of the other uh, subsections out there. And then finally, system management. We're talking about a system, and we, we, those of you who have been listening to this, we've talked about a DCN, a distributed control node, you know, which is a, a node that has one, two, dozen, you know, some number of I.O. on it. But we're talking about a system, eventually, out there that may have 10,000 to 100,000 of these out there. System management of this, as well as security management of this, has to be completely automated. There is no way people are going to touch that many uh, devices out there when you've got to make a change or when something happens, when a new security issue comes out, or you've got a system management issue, some, 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 something is, uh, is going on and I need to restart or I need to uh, modify these. So these technical reference models are coming out. Uh, the, the different parts of the TRM, they're all going to be coming out uh, relatively uh, soon uh, from a standard standpoint, which means we hope in 2018 and we'll have all those available, uh, with the first one coming out in, uh, in May. Here are some of the, uh, the standards that we're looking at uh, in, incorporating in here. Now, uh, again, this is a preview. Some things are subject to change, but these are the ones we really are considering. Obviously, 611.31-3, which is a well-known and, and well-understood uh, uh, standard. And uh, we are actively working with and trying to create the liaisons with the PLC Open Group, which has the, uh, the definition of how you exchange 1131-3 programs. Uh, 61499, distributed function blocks. Again, the same sort of thing. You know, when you're programming, uh, a, a system, as we're looking at for OPRAF path, you're not programming the individual devices because there's 100,000 out there. You are creating your entire system strategy or strategies for different parts, you know, strategy for a fractionator, strategy for a filler, a boiler, et cetera. And then that gets distributed down automatically. That's what the 61499 spec defines. Uh, obviously, the OPC UA has been one that we have been looking at very strongly for the con connectivity framework. Um, the Automation ML, if you're not familiar with it, Automation ML is a way to describe configurations. Remember, I said we had a portable format definition. So we're looking at, at this right now as the structure for the portable format definitions, and we're working to get a liaison with Automation ML uh, uh, and that group doing it against an IEC group. The same with ZVEI or ZVEI, we've got to say it the right way. Yes, uh, and they have their module uh, type package, which is a, a way to include not just the automation ML side of it, but some of the HMI functions with plans to include alarm management and history management as well. Uh, DMTF, if you're not familiar with, is a, is a system management function for managing the hardware that's out there. Uh, FDI, alarm management, uh, ISA security, there's going to be several others, but this is giving you a flavor of the sort of standards that we are looking at. Taking all these standards, combining them together, and guess what? You can create a system from those. Uh, we're using the TOGAF standard or methodology, so the enterprise architecture group is doing that, just to keep us on track and making sure that we're actually developing this the correct way. 
You've seen this one before, it's slightly modified a little bit. Um, you'll notice we have the DCNs down there, the distributed control nodes. Uh, just a little bit of a preview, a DCN is made up of two elements, a DCP, a distributed control platform, which is the hardware it's gonna run on, and a distributed control framework, which is the software elements that the applications are going to run inside. Um, the DCFs, can be anywhere, they could be sitting in the DCNs, they could be sitting inside a, a PLC or a DCS or an analyzer. They could participate, they could be uh, operating in a big uh, enterprise class uh, server if you wanted to do that as the advanced computing element. Um, so this is uh, the, the idea of, these are the elements, okay, again, very uh, high level uh, description of it. They'll be executing the level two and level three ISA 95 act the functions that we have in, down here, which is control, alarm, HMI, but also the level three scheduling, uh, analysis, uh, data collection, data historians, and those sort of things. And they could be running either distributed, again, 61499 lets you distribute that, or it could be running centralized, maybe because you need uh, more resources than you can put in a, in a, in a uh, DCN that's available. Pick your size. Okay, short, tall, grande, vente, uh, Trenta. How many of you have actually had one of the, the, the Trantas? Okay, it's a 32 ounce iced coffee. Yes, how many days did you stay up? <laughs> anyway, yeah, you, can, you can pick those. It's, uh, the idea here is that we are trying to define an architecture where we are defining an architecture where you can go from very small, just a couple DCNs with, with a small number of I.O., hopefully these things, these things are going to be a very reasonable price, down to a very large complete control system with the same architecture involved. Because if I'm controlling just a simple little boiler and that's it, you know, I've only got a couple loops on it, I've only got a couple I.O., but that people today, what do you do? Well, I have to buy a PLC, I've got to buy a bigger DCS, it's a real pain. I cannot scale what I need to what my problem space is many times because the steps are so big. The steps here are tiny. Okay, so all the way from single point, multi-point I.O., small system, maybe gateways to existing controllers, maybe embedded functionality in something. Again, if, if you have embedded functionality in a, a PLC, DCS, or analyzer, it's actually participating in the control strategy. It's running the applications that are OPATH compatible, all the way up to advanced computing platforms. Uh, I won't go over these, but these are the architecture, uh, these are the quality attributes driving the architecture that we have. Uh, so we're not only looking at these quality attributes, but we're also looking at the other ones. This was the top 10, but there were actually 20 out there, and we have various principles on it. So in our meetings as we're going through, and I'm showing uh, the, the architecture to show you how the pieces fit together, these are our driving uh, attributes. These, these are our driving principles. Every time we look at this, we say, does this help us in interoperability and modularity and affordability and portability and all those elements of it? Okay, and the architecture and part of the, 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 the you'll see in the TRM is that we're looking not just at the DCN itself, but we're also looking at the life cycle. What's it actually take to get those things in place? So uh, there's a planning, uh, design, and a development uh, phase that goes on. Uh, there's, there's, they're testing and deploying and there's operating and maintaining it. And there's these different activities that go on inside there. There are activities from the core component suppliers, you know, those that are providing the DCNs, the DCFs, the DCPs, the applications, or, or, uh, the, the, the uh, platform dependent applications. Uh, there are the platform independent application suppliers who are going to write applications that are going to run on anybody's DCN that supports that profile. And then there's what we call CS applications or con companion spec specification applications, something like the 1131-3 programs or the 61499 uh, uh, function block diagrams and programs that the system integrators or the end users will typically build. The heavy arrows are essentially where we would have standards. Standards that would either define how the things interact or where the information is exchanged between these different activities. So the technical architecture lays out exactly where these different uh, standards apply and, and what those different standards are. Now, so we also look at it this way, which is to say, okay, uh, based on the role that uh, is being performed, how do we create the marketplaces for these different things? So, uh, for example, uh, there may be a marketplace for a software supplier, which is independent of the hardware supplier. So there may be somebody building what we call the DCP, 
distributed control platform, and then somebody else who's putting their software on it, the DCF, the framework, or else putting their application on top of that as well uh, that they need to build. Uh, subsystem integrators, people who put them together, uh, system integrators, and then finally the end users, uh, the, the ones who have to put it all together. So the idea here is marketplaces, marketplaces of interoperable components. So we're designing the, arc, uh, the technical architecture in modules so that each module is basically can be standalone and redefined, can be replaced, can be evolved essentially as new functionality shows up. Okay, so here's the sneak preview of what we're looking at. Now in the TRM, there's gonna be a whole lot more details, but we're gonna give you this a little bit. We have the distributed control node, uh, which could also be running a, a, an advanced computing platform that we're talking about, server class software. And inside there, I said we had a platform DCP and a DCF. We've got uh, the portable format definitions and companion specifications. You know, so for example, IEC 1131-3, uh, there's actually, a, that would be a companion specification on the base configuration that we have for each of the DCNs that are out there. So a DCN would accept and have within it uh, a definition of, of basic information. For example, uh, the tags it may have, the alarms it may have, maybe the history that it may be maintaining, those sort of things. But then also we may have a DCN that would support one of the companion specifications. So if it supported the 1131-3 or the 61499 companion specifications, that means we could download that program segment into the DCN and it will execute down there. So that's what those things are. That's a standard format definition. And as I said, we're, we're, we're talking to, to people out there who have those sort of things like the Automation ML and the ZVEI uh, group to say what those companion specs are. Uh, in order to get that information down, we're gonna have a configuration management interface, a set of web services that are available or, or some, some mechanism for, off, uh, for the configuration management tools to download that. But those tool, tools are, are outside the scope of what we're defining. We expect the marketplace to develop for people to support tools to say, how do I build my configurations? How do I get it down to the 10,000 or 100,000 nodes? Application management, same sort of thing. If I've got 10,000 or 100,000 nodes, I buy a piece of software and let's say it's a distributed software, let's say it's a distributed analysis program. How do I get that into all those nodes? How do I control that? We'll have an application management interface and then again, tools to do it. System management interface, I'm starting the system up, shutting the system down. It, it, it is 10,000 nodes and I've got to control those. I may have to, uh, I may have to update the, the BIOS on these systems. I may have to update, update the application programs. System management services will give us that. Uh, the connectivity framework interfaces are, are how these things talk together. What's the communication across the wire here that they actually use, the protocol that's needed. Uh, the networking physical interface, are we talking you know, 10 base T, 100 base T, are we talking one gig networks? What's, how are these things gonna connect up? If we have a little module, in one case of the DCN, one profile of that would be a small module that would fit on some DIN rack or something like that. You know, we want standard power, we want standard uh, connection to the uh, uh, ethernet connections or whatever we have, and we want standard connections to the terminals as well on the physical interface side of it. So um, in the uh, TRM, you'll see a lot more details about how these things are broken up. You'll see definitions of what each of those interfaces are. This is what's coming. This is what we're developing right now. Okay, so snapshot one coming out May of 2018, hopefully April, but let's be practical. It's gonna be May, it's gonna be early May uh, of 2018 for public release with later parts following in 2018. Okay, so the first part of it says here's the big elements, here's how the elements work together, here's what each of the elements does. The rest of the parts of it says, okay, for this element, here are the interfaces that we define, here's the, the standards that we are referencing, you know, here's the detailed functions that we have in such uh, detail that people can then go off and can actually start to implement the pieces on there. So this is it, this is coming soon. You've seen a quick, quick preview. Uh, you've seen some of the pieces that we have here. Hopefully you've seen how we are addressing what those requirements are, how we were going to define a, a technical architecture, which is a set of interfaces, so that we can meet what those goals were for the, uh, for the standards. So I'm gonna close this with an assertion. 
And the assertion is uh, we have the opportunity for a quantum change in capability, functionality, usability, extensibility, and control systems without compromising anything that we currently have in terms of reliability and security. This is an assertion, and you see here we added that. The, only what, the, the old way of doing things is not going to get us where we want to go. Okay? We have to change the architecture. The DCS architecture has not changed in over 30 years. As a matter of fact, the DCS architecture, the D no longer stands for distributed. <laughs> I won't tell you what it stands for because they died out whenever the big satellite, or the, the big meteor hit you know, 65 million years ago. Um, the new realities of computing power, networks, and high performance HMIs give us the capability to improve productivity and production in ways we couldn't imagine. These are assertions, but I believe they're true. This is what's happening in other industries. We, in this industry today, we're typically behind the curve. With these sort of efforts that we're doing right now, we are riding that wave. We are applying the technologies as they're coming out today and instead of 10, 15 years later. So it's a call to actions. Again, the same sort of thing. End users and vendors, please join us in this. This is a journey that we all have to take. This is a journey that if we don't drive this future, somebody else is going to drive it for us. So we have this choice today. So I'll leave you with that, and I think we're going to go on to questions. Okay.